Uh, Professor Vitali Volpert is a senior research director at the French National Center for Scientific Research. He is also a director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Mathematical Modeling in Biomedicine in Russia's People Friendship University. After earning his PhD, he worked at the Institutes of Chemical Physics, and then he went to the United States, where he worked as a visiting researcher at the current Institute of Mathematical Science and as, as a research fellow at the Department of Material Science of Northwest University. Uh, today, he, he is a member of uh, the editorial board of several journals, and he is the founder and editor-in-chief of the journal Mathematical Modeling of Natural Phenomena. And over the course of his career, he published over 400 peer-reviewed journal articles and more than eight books and monographs. His research interests include partial differential equations, functional analysis, and mathematical modeling in chemistry, biology, and medicine. Recently, he has been uh, publishing several studies on various epidemiological and immunological questions uh, related to COVID-19, which I hope he will share some of them uh, with us today. Uh, please, Professor Vitali Volpert, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation for the seminar and for this uh, presentation. So I will share my screen. Yes, I hope you. And uh, the topic of my today's presentation is mathematical modeling of the coronavirus disease. And in fact, I don't know precisely the background of uh, people attending and listening to me. So uh, though it is called mathematical modeling, but it will be very simple and accessible to everybody for large public. So uh, I would like to begin uh, with this slide, which shows what we call multi-scale problems in biology, in biological modeling. For me, it was very impressive to realize that Viruses are such small, tiny particles that if you take all these virus particles from all people infected in the world now, we could put all of them just in one glass, as shown here at the left. Can you imagine this? And at the same time, the whole world population now is concerned. So you see this very different uh, scales of this problem. And of course, when we want to model that, it imposes some just uh, restrictions and difficulties. So how we can approach to such problems? problems. In fact, there are different, different levels of this uh, modeling of the studies, and some of them are shown here. And uh, uh, we can begin with, uh, 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 with the investigation of infection spread in cell culture, uh, then, of course, immune response, and both of them either when we study infection development in tissues and organs of human organisms, for example. Also the questions related to virus mutations. Of course, we know there are many epidemiological studies and all of them come together here in immune epidemiology. Of course, I cannot discuss all these questions today. In fact, each of them is a huge topic. So what I will do, I will briefly discuss some of them, uh, beginning with infection spreading and cell culture, then very shortly about immune response, and then about infection development in tissues and organs. And uh, I will talk about some of our recent works or even ongoing works. So let us begin with this question about infection spreading and cell culture. And here you see experimental data on the coronavirus infection in uh, epithelial cells and the culture of epithelial cells. It's not for the new virus, it's for the old one, but I suppose that it's basically very, very close. So you, you see here in this experimental uh, uh, images, this red color, it shows infected cells. So <clears throat> of course, as we, know, uh, as we know, virus reproduces in this infect cells, then it uh, released in, uh, into the extracellular matrix. It goes to the surrounding cells. And this is why uh, how this infection spreads in cell culture. And these um, graphs in the right show the total virus load in the culture, how it changes in time. And we can, we can notice here that there are 
first uh, uh, vir viral uh, titus decrease because virus needs some time to start reproducing at usually several hours. For example, here it's about 10 hours and then this uh, rapid growth and then the growth rate becomes a little bit slower. And I will return it just now in the modern. So how can we model uh, such kind of problems? Uh, this is, uh, you see this equation at the left, uh, this is what we call reaction diffusion systems of equations uh, with time delay. So very briefly to explain what it is about without going into details. So there are three variables, U for uninfected cells, I for infected cells, and V for virus. So virus infects these uninfected cells. This is why we have here this minus some constant A, U times V. And the same with sign plus for the infected cells. So this plus UV, then infected cells can die. This is why we have this minus beta I here in the second equation. And finally, in the third equation, we have <clears throat> this uh, virus uh, concentration. Virus can diffuse in the extracellular matrix, the diffusion term. Virus is reproduced by these infected cells and virus can die. So this is this quite simple model but it appears that it gives a good description of you know, what is happens in cell culture. And here in the right graph, you can see this distribution. So X is the space variable and each curve here shows a virus density distribution for each particular moment of time. So uh, yeah, uh, this time you see this, this curves move from the left to the right. This is how this virus spreads in the cell culture. And mathematically speaking, we call such solutions reaction diffusion waves, and we can study the different properties. In particular, the speed of this wave propagation, which is very important because it characterizes virus virulence. So this is, uh, we compare these uh, simulations with the experimental results for two types of viruses, for poliovirus and for coronavirus. You see, for example, here, this, this red dots, this are experimental data, and blue curve, it's uh, this modeling. And you see uh, that it describes quite well. Um, and again, as before, as for the experimental data, we see this three stages of infection development. In the beginning, uh, virus, uh, total virus load decreases during several hours because it needs some time to begin to reproduce. Then very rapid, this explosive virus uh, replication, the next stage, and then quite slow, quite slow growth or even constant uh, just uh, value here. This last part, this corresponds exactly to this propagation of reaction diffusion wave. Uh, and this is quite similar for coronavirus. Well, there are some, some sometimes small differences with the growth rate, but basically uh, we can describe quite precisely um, the uh, virus development, uh, infection development in cell cultures, and we can identify the parameters from the experimental data. There are many questions related to that, and of course I cannot stop on them now. Just to mention one of the ongoing works, well, just you have uh, previously discussed in, in the beginning of this um, meeting, uh, different variants and how they uh, develop, how they replace each other. So we can do the same in simulations. We can introduce virus mutations and we can consider the emergence of uh, different uh, variants and how they uh, develop in time. And uh, just a new variant as shown here, uh, in these uh, graphs can gradually replace the, the previous variant. So next, the next uh, question I will briefly discuss now, it's about immune response, uh, innate adaptive and inflammation, how it works. But of course we uh, should uh, we know now all that, so I will, not stop, I will not stop in detail on that. So we know that virus replicates in host cells, so it penetrates here in the host cells. There are several, then several stages of uh, this repli virus replication, and then new viral uh, particles just go back to the extracellular matrix and propagate in the tissue. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, we have the immune response in our body. 
um, sh shown also schematically here, and in, it includes the uh, interferon, interferon production in the uh, infected cells, uh, production of various pro-inflammatory cytokines, cytokines, which play a very important role, of course, also. And then all the cells of innate immune response, like macrophages, like dendritic cells, uh, what they call antigen presenting cells, they are activated, and then in their turn, they activate uh, T lymphocytes, uh, which become like the CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells, and these helper cells, they activate B lymphocytes, which produce uh, antibodies. So, this is very, uh, very sh shortly about immune response. It is largely discussed now, of course. Uh, you can also uh, mention this, what is called hyperinflammation or cy cytokine storm related to excessive pro production of these uh, pro inflammatory uh, cytokines. So, then uh, we can put all that in the model, which is schematically shown here. I will not repeat all the same, but uh, also we have these different types of cells epithelial cells, uninfected, infected, and uh, cells of uh, innate immune response, of adaptive immune response. All of them interact. Uh, we can describe all that with some mathematical model, in particular, what is shown here. It's a, uh, some complex systems of ordinary differential equations. And then we can study this model. And I will just illustrate uh, some uh, typical results with, uh, of such modeling. So here at the left, you see this red curve. It's uh, the viral load uh, as a function of time. Uh, in different cases, for example, if we take into account only innate immune response, so we can have this curve uh, shown here, this first, first peak of viral load. Uh, 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 if we uh, introduce also uh, adaptive immune response, so you see this dashed, uh, dashed line, dot dashed line, uh, so it, it decreases viral load, but then sometime later, viral load increases and becomes even higher than it was before. So it's quite complex uh, systems uh, and complex nonlinear dynamics, uh, which difficult to um, describe or to expect without modeling. So we see here that uh, modeling can, can be really useful to, to describe how it happens. And uh, show what, uh, what I show here in the middle figure is how the maximal viral load depends on the initial viral load. I think that this is a very interesting question and very important for practical applications. So these three different curves, like green curve, uh, light blue, and dark blue curves, they correspond <clears throat> to, uh, well, in some sense, to different patients, to different uh, intensity of the individual immune response. But not important now, let, let us take just, for example, this dark blue curve. So at the X axis, horizontal axis, we put uh, this initial viral load. So how the disease will develop depending on the initial viral load. So this is the answer given by this dark blue curve. So if the initial viral load is sufficiently small, nothing will happen. The disease does not develop. Immune response completely suppress disease development. But there is some threshold here. It corresponds to 200. So if the initial viral load is larger than that, then you see the disease begins to develop. And the maximal viral load also increases as a function of the initial viral load. So this is what is important to understand here. It's not just a question where some, somebody gets some initial viral load, some initial infection, whether he or she is contaminated. What is important here is the, uh, this initial viral load, how much this person is contaminated. This is a crucial point. For example, in the beginning, well, uh, in fact, I don't know exactly how, how it was in the United States, but in France, in the beginning of epidemic, it was largely discussed. It was a very strange discussion for me, but it was due, so during several months, it, it was discussed whether we should have masks or not. It's just, now, now it looks like a stupid 
question, but it was discussed during several time, uh, several months. And here we, we see, uh, in some sense, mathematical answer to this question. Yes, masks, maybe they don't completely protect us, maybe, but at least they decrease the initial viral load. And this is very important. Another interesting question is about incubation period. It's also something which looks for me quite interesting. For example, like more than a year ago, again, when this epidemic began, uh, for me, it was quite surprising, like when there were first data about the duration of the incubation period, and these data were very, very different. So the first, the first uh, data were the, the first like information was that the incubation period can vary from several days to several weeks. How it is possible? It is the same virus for the same virus. How it happens that the incubation periods can be so different? And the answer is again here. In fact, it depends on the individual uh, immune response and on the initial viral load. If we fix the person, means if we fix the parameters of the individual immune response and we vary the initial viral load, so what happens? Again, as before, if the initial viral load is sufficiently small, nothing happens, the, the disease does not develop. Then uh, we uh, go through the threshold, and then uh, if the initial viral load is just a little bit greater, then the incubation period is large. But then when we increase the initial viral load, the incubation period decreases. So again, as before, for the maximal viral load, incubation period also strongly depends on the initial viral load, and we should take it into account in modeling and also in, in various practical aspects. Okay, so let us continue uh, to, to, the next, to the next question, how this infection de develops in tissues and organs of our organism. In some sense, we take these two previous uh, questions and bring them together. And here you see um, the image of the lung uh, during this coronavirus disease. With this green areas, it's damaged, damaged areas of the lung. So how we can understand what is happening here? And uh, I will discuss very briefly, of course, uh, two questions related to uh, this infection, uh, coronavirus infection in the lungs. And these two questions are how infection progresses in bronchi. And in fact, well, it's not just this is a work of progress. I will just show some uh, preliminary well results or uh, methods to study that. And then uh, uh, just a recent, recently finished work about thromboinflammation in lung arteries. So let us start with the first question. So what happens in bronchi? It is shown schematically here. here. So in fact, uh, what uh, uh, we should know here that there is a layer of epithelial cells uh, which contain several cell types, in particular goblet cells producing mucus and ciliated cells shown here with the cilia, which have this periodic motion and which they push mucus uh, uh, and together with mucus, they push uh, a lot of like, uh, different things like uh, virus, bacteria, cell uh, parts of uh, dead cells and many other things. They're removed from the lungs due to this mucus motion. So what happens when uh, this infection uh, penetrates here? So this uh, virus in particular, coronavirus, but it is very, very close to other types like influenza virus they infect the cells and some of the cells because of the infection they can die uh, or they can be influenced in some other way so they produce less mucus or uh, there are less cilia cells which push push this uh, mucus so of course it can influence uh, all this uh, infection uh, development and how and how our organism fight the infection so how we can model that all uh, we discussed just virus development and cell culture, but uh, but now we should add something else, in particular mucus motion. And in fact, we studied this question previously 
uh, in, in a different study related to uh, the disease called mucoviscidosis. It's a genetic disease, quite, uh, quite uh, hard, uh, quite heavy. Uh, but the point is that this disease is related to abnormal mucous motion. So we describe it here with some, again, with some model, of course, and we can measure how the mucous motion and it's the bits of the mucous layer, uh, how, uh, how it works in uh, different generations of uh, bronchi in the lungs. So what we do now, and this is what I say, is it's a work progress. We have the three elements, in fact. We have this left figure uh, image. We, we know how to describe uh, infection spread in cell culture. This middle image, we add this uh, immune response. In the right image, we add mucous motion. We have these three elements. We put them together, and we'll see what happens. But uh, I, uh, we don't have the results right, uh, not yet to present it now. And the last topic of my today's presentation is uh, about thromboinflammation in pulmonary circulation. So uh, I have a question to the organizers. How much time do I have more? Uh, I can just I, adapt I to, 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 rema to remaining time. OK, five minutes. So I, I will do that, and it's quite, quite fast. So we know very well that uh, this uh, coronavirus disease, but in fact, it was known also before for influenza virus that it can uh, uh, lead to some to the excessive um, blood coagulation in uh, lung arteries, and these arteries can be completely uh, occluded, and then it modifies uh, the pulmonary circulation, and as a result of that, uh, blood oxygenation. So to describe this process, we need to understand how it works, what is blood coagulation, and how it works. And very shortly, there are two main parts of that. It's uh, biochemical reactions in plasma called coagulation cas cascade and platelet aggregation. And then all that can be described by uh, mathematical models. In particular, if we study uh, uh, clot growth in quiescent plasma, these are reaction diffusion equations, and the results are shown here. We see this green. Uh, uh, circles and red circles, green circles, it responds to what is called thrombin. It's one of the most important uh, proteins participating in blood coagulation. And we, if we take a, cross, a vertical cross section here and we measure this thrombin concentration, we'll, we'll have these graphs as shown here. Again, it propagates in time as a reaction diffusion wave. Then, if, if we consider <clears throat> uh, this process in blood flow, in blood arteries, then we should also consider um, blood flow, of course, and there are different ways to model blood flow. In particular, uh, we can consider navier stokes equations. Uh, so it changes uh, this uh, clot shape as shown here, and these particular simulations are done by Anas Bushnita. So now the next um, stage is platelets. From here, this is just green windows, the grid, and they form a lot of blocks. Part of them can be removed, but also, um, it's not so now, uh, but this is response to the experimental results are shown here in the left, uh, in the left images. Because this is blue area, it's a brand white cloud form, and this is used in biological reaction, and this is the real thing. Uh, Professor Vitali, uh, it seems that there is some noises, so we, we can't hear you uh, clearly now, so... Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the videos on the screen are making it okay. difficult to hear you. So, okay, no video yes, anymore. No. Let's try. I, I'll just have several minutes to finish. So I just very briefly showed this blood coagulation in normal situation, what happens uh, in the case of inflammation? This is called thromboinflammation. We have previously studied it for some other diseases, in particular for rheumatoid arthritis, shown here. And we know that these uh, inflammatory cytokines 
uh, here they are related to this rheumatoid arthritis, in particular uh, tumor necrosis factor or some interleukins. They can, these are uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. They can, they lead to excessive blood coagulation and the risk of cardiovascular events is multiplied by 10 uh, in the case of rheumatoid arthritis because of this uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So this again, uh, now if we uh, discuss what happens for COVID-19 patients. So uh, again, simulations done by ANAS. If we compare these figures in the middle, this is normal blood plasma uh, in the left and COVID-19 patients on the right. And this red area, this is fibrin clot. So we see that this fibrin clot is much larger uh, in COVID-19 patients than in normal uh, plasma. The problem here is that when we study pulmonary circulation, if we take just one as shown here as before, the models are already quite complex, but there are many studies and in, we basically understand the most important how, uh, things about blood coagulation. This is just one vessel. <clears throat> but then if we take pulmonary circulation, there are millions of vessels. How we can, and there is no, no way to, to describe that in the same level of detailization as before. So how we can describe all that? Uh, there are other approaches. Uh, this is what is called uh, one-dimensional models of blood circulation. Uh, the model is shown here. Uh, such models uh, are uh, allow us to study not just one or several vessels, but many vessels because they're much more uh, economic, if I can say, from the modeling point of view. Of course, even with such simplified models, we cannot consider millions of vessels, but we can consider at least several dozens of them. Uh, so this table show uh, these different generations of blood vessels in the pulmonary circulation. Since time is very limited, I will not stop on that. So we'll take just we take here in the study just a small part of this huge uh, tree of blood vessels. We take the several dozens of them here, shown on the right, and then we suppose that because of inflammation in the lung, some of these vessels here can uh, initiate blood coagulation. So in the inflammation. This inflammation can initiate blood coagulation, but it's only a possibility. In fact, whether it will happen or not depends on many parameters, on coagulation parameters, and also on the parameters of blood flow. So we do all this study and we can estimate now uh, this how uh, this clot growth occurs uh, the strong inflammation, how it happens, you can estimate uh, how many blood vessels are occluded and how uh, much uh, this blood circulation is decreased. I think, uh, Vitaly, can you hear us? Okay, we'll give him a Since minute. We lost him, so. He'll probably try and reconnect. Um, 